Hello everyone, today we've got Annabelle to talk us through uh, Search 101, an introduction to information retrieval. So hopefully you're ready to, to learn about how Google works, I'm hoping, is what I'll get out of this. Um, so yeah, let's give a round of applause to Annabelle for making it here. Now, in study saying Google, I assume she means the search engine, not the really big company that does a bunch of different things. But yeah, a little bit about how search engines like Google work, as well as a lot of other things. Um, so yeah, to just get started, a little bit about me. So I'm a software engineering student here at UQ. It's my sixth year, but I usually say final year, so it doesn't make me sound as old. Um, my pronouns are they, them, and on the UQCS Slack, my handle is at a Cooper. So feel free to message me about any questions you have afterwards. So before I start talking about search, I need to talk a little bit about natural language processing. So for those of you who don't know what natural language processing is, it's the branch of computer science concerned with giving computers the ability to understand text and spoken words. That's why I have a fancy definition. Essentially making it computers understand human language, um, which is kind of a complicated task. Now, I find NLP to be quite interesting because it's a way of branching the gap between you know, people and computers. So I've done a little bit of work in this area. I say a little bit, I've done a couple of projects and some courses. Um, so I've done some stuff with chatbots, which is pretty interesting. And I've managed to take a language technology course on Exchange, which is very lucky, back when we were able to leave Australia. Um, yeah, I took the master's level course that's run here at UQ on information retrieval and web search, which is really interesting. Um, so I'd encourage you to take that if you have the opportunity to, or if you have a thesis, try and get a supervisor who's in that area. And um, just this most recent summer, I was working as an intern at Canva in the search recommendations group. So done a bit of different things with search and NLP. So. When I say information retrieval, this is kind of the more theoretical, technical term that people use for search. So that's the whole field concerned with the structure, analysis, storage, searching, and retrieval of information. So search isn't just, say, Google. It can be so many different things. So we have search within search engines. So you are sending queries to the entire internet, to things like e-commerce, where you're trying to find what product you want to buy on eBay, or on smaller commerce websites like Shopify, which is a service, to things like files, looking up files on your computer, looking up apps on your phone, looking up music in Spotify. There's so many different areas that search is used. But generally speaking, it's mainly about connecting users to the information that they're trying to find. So I find this really interesting because to me, it's kind of this nice middle spot in between user-centered, like, design and programming and backend dev. Very few things are in this middle zone, so I find it very exciting that I found something in here um, because I really like that sort of stuff. So search as a process. Um, this here is pretty much what I think most people's general understanding of how search works is. You type in a query, it goes in, out pops some results, you're good. It's a bit of a black box. Now, a more expanded but still simplified diagram of how that works is broadly, oh look, there's a query. I don't know why that person duplicated. Good job, Canva. Um, so you have a query that gets sent through. This query is passed. It's then, those terms are searched against an index, which we had built beforehand, and we get some results. But you see, implementing all of that from scratch is kind of annoying and really complicated. So a lot of times, smaller scale, um, uses of search, they just build on existing platforms, and the two big ones are Solar, which is by Apache, and Elasticsearch, which is by Elastic. So those frameworks provide ways for you to do all this indexing and all this query passing and all of these things in a way that you can customize for your specific search situation rather than having to write everything from scratch. So Another thing to think about from the programming and operation perspective is this whole idea of index time versus query time. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about indexing and query things further along, but what we're all probably most familiar with is things happening at query time. So you've typed in your Google query, 
what is the weather today in Brisbane? Preparing yourself to be disappointed because it's raining. And um, it will process this query, search through the documents, so web pages, to try and find something that's relevant and retrieving this information. Now, for a search engine, this needs to happen really, really quickly. Like, if it takes two seconds for you to get your query back, no, nah, don't care for that. I'm gonna walk away and try and find another search engine. I don't want things to be slow. So things happening at query time needs to be really optimized because if you take too long, users will lose interest and just click away and not bothered. That's actually a thing that, this isn't just me being judgmental about how I use Google. It's actually a thing that people have to think about quite a lot. So whatever you do decide to do at query time, it, you have to make it really, really fast a lot of the time, if you're able to. On the other hand, we have index time. So when index time is referring to when we index the documents in our corpus or whatever collection we have. Um, corpus is another word for collection that's mainly used in like text document speech, but whatever big data set that you want that you're indexing, whether that's a bunch of photos, whether that's a bunch of web pages, whether that's a bunch of documents, whatever information that is. Um, we don't just have like an SQL database sitting around for that. To make an efficient search, you have to build an inverted index of all the fields of the document. So when it's indexed, it usually takes ages to initially index a data set. So if you have like a million documents, it can take a while. For this presentation, I initially tried to index a two million document um, JSON file about books and it took an hour and a half to run and then it crashed so that wasn't great but um, so that's the thing where indexing whatever happens at index time you want to run that very infrequently because it takes a really long time um, but usually you don't need to rerun it once you've indexed it unless you've made changes to the schema which I'm going to get into a little bit later so yeah query index things happening at different times Okay, so in terms of how this, um, how we have to consider these things when we are writing things, um, we have to think of how much memory we have in processing. I'm only going to touch on this a little bit, but just kind of gets to the idea further about what we're talking about with query speed and things like that. So say I decide I want to handle synonyms of my query. So for, is it raining in Brisbane? It wants to also like insert synonyms like drizzling or pouring or so on and so forth. So if someone is designing, say, a weather search system, you have to consider what constraints you have because, yeah, if you have limited memory for, if you want very, very fast results, you could index all these synonyms and be like, okay, weather data, I'm gonna also index all these synonyms so it'll match straight away. So that'll use more memory, but it will speed things up at query time. But if you have limited memory on the back end, you might wanna be processing all these synonyms at query time, as an example. Yeah. So, um, in terms of indexing, um, I'm going to just go through an example in Solar because that's what I'm most familiar with and I'll show you a bit more in a minute. But, um, yeah, so, um, making a schema. So, I'm just going to show you here what I'm talking about with all my schema jargon. Okay, so this here is Solar. It is running. Um, if we look over here, I'm, I have an example data set which is some movies. Um, the sort of stuff that we have for our movies is there's a whole bunch of different fields that we've had set up. Let me show you through here, it's a lot easier. Okay, cool. We have some movie data in our solar thing. So we have a bunch of different fields that were provided from the data set that is what has been indexed. So we have our ID and we also have you know director information, genre name, so on and so forth. So that sort of information we have to store in a way that can get indexed. Come back. Okay, cool. So the main three areas that we kind of are important to us when indexing, when we're defining a schema is the field, the field type, and unique key. All of these sound like overly technical terms, but it's actually quite straightforward. So for all the information that we're storing, we have different fields that stores different information. So in terms of a movie, we'd have, okay, the name of the movie, maybe who directed it, what genre is it, what actors are in it, all these different fields. So we'd have those defined as specific fields, so then we can filter by and do all sorts of other things further down the line. The other thing is defining what 
type this field is. So for a date, we would want to define it to be this is a date field and be expecting it. A lot of the times we're just looking at text, so you can look at strings, but other things you might have um, included a field for movie runtime, and that would need to be an integer. So that affects some things in the back end and just making sure that when you load <laughs> your documents, if things don't line up properly, it will get cranky at you, but for good reason. And the other thing which is really important is setting up a unique key, which is the unique identifier for each document. Um, that's really important because you, well, you need to separate each document, but you, oftentimes you have to choose a specific key that's different. Because for example, if you did it by movie title, there are many movies where there are multiple movies with the exact same name. There's, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. My first thought was Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but I think the 1950s version has a slightly different name. <laughs> but there are movies with the exact same title. Um, so that would not serve as a good unique identifier because then you would have one overriding the other. So this is the example schema that I wrote, which looks like a bunch of gobbledygook, but I'll explain to you what's actually happening in this. So um, this is the schema written up for, that I wrote up for my movie data set. So we have our films.json file, which is a bunch of film information. So for the film Happy Feet, this is the JSON object that we have. So we have, you know, the ID, we have the initial release date, the name of the movie, genre, which is a list, and all of that. So by looking at this information here, I had to map it into my schema to actually get Solar to take all this JSON data and do the relevant things with it. So you can't see too, oh, you can see a bit better on here than I can. Okay, so ones at the top, they're pretty easy to map. So we just have all these field names and then we have what type they are. So um, like we have our ID, name, genre, directed by, all these things. A lot of them are what we have text general, which I'll explain in a minute why that's different to a string. But yeah, so different properties about it. So whether it's indexed and whether it's stored and whether it's required. Now, you might be thinking, okay, what's the difference between indexed and stored? That pretty much sounds like the same thing in our context. Um, the difference would be, um, with all this data, you, the index that is built, it is a separate structure to whatever data set you have. It's not like the solar is directly copying my JSON file, and <laughs> that's not how indexing works. To make it efficient to look up, you make an inverted index, which is its own particular structure. So some of these fields, if you know that you're not interested in it or um, different things like that, or we might have excessive information, you might not actually need to store it um, for looking up later. You might only need it in the index. So a good example might be if there's like a brief blur, you might not need that to come up when you do the search, but it might be useful to still have that indexed so you can search through it. Um, the other thing is being uh, whether it's required or not. So that's quite straightforward. Movie names are important. If I didn't have a name, I would not really want to see this document, you know, because it's not giving me the right information. And also whether or not it can be multi-valued, because some things like genre and directors can be multi-valued, but having multiple initial release dates, that's not physically possible for a movie. Then it's no longer an initial release date. So the other thing here, we have a unique key, which is the ID, which is unique. And then we have some fancy stuff down here, which I'll go into more, but essentially um, a separate, the field type for string is defined, you know, it's saying, oh, it's a string, the solar string field was good built in solar stuff. Um, and then we have text general, which is essentially a text field. So it's special in that it's different from strings in that a couple of filters get applied to it, which I'm not gonna go over too far into because this is a 101, but an example being it has lowercase filter factory applied to it, which means when you, at index time, everything in text general will automatically be converted to lowercase, uh, which makes it easier for lookup and a whole bunch of other reasons why generally you put everything in lowercase. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about indexing, which is the more complicated, less interesting stuff. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, query parsing which I can go on and on about, so feel free to ask questions about this because I'm just kind of um, skimming the surface of how this sort of stuff works with NLP. So, does, has anyone heard of Zip's Law before or any of this stuff with stop words? Okay, I see a couple of hands, this is quite good. Um, so, query parsing is, if you might have got from the previous slide, is 
taking out a query and doing some things to it so it works better with the computer on the other end. So one, a couple of things that are really common are looking at removing stop words. So stop words are the most common words of a language. So in English, it's words like the and of, all these little words that we put in between that don't have much meaning in and of themselves. Now, Zipf's law is this idea that the, um, all of these words, it's kind of a big um, graph like this, where the ones that occur really, really frequently, they, they don't have much meaning and they're all at the beginning and they are really frequent and they occur really often and then it kind of drops off. Um, once you, all these words, once you have the drop off, are words that generally actually have meaning. So you might have, you know, university or water bottle or duck all the way down here because they're less common. So you know that those words will be actually containing useful information in a search query while searching and doesn't have much meaning in a search query because it's absolutely everywhere. So that's one thing that can apply to a query. Um, I'll go through an example in a minute. And another thing that often gets done is stemming, um, which is a way to get to the core part of a word. So that's usually by removing prefixes or suffixes. Um, there are many algorithms which have different techniques. A really common one is the Porter stemmer. But um, yeah, a tricky thing about stemming is it doesn't necessarily always maintain, it doesn't account for the different meanings of the same word. So for example here, ducks and duckling are referring to the animal, a duck. But ducking and ducked is referring to the action of you know, physically ducking. But it's very hard for a computer to work that out. But regardless, when you, have, when you stem these words, if you have a pretty basic stemmer, it's all just going to bring it down to duck, which can complicate things. But that's why there's a lot of different ones of these designed to handle things in different ways. OK, so this is an example of query parsing that I have here. So. Um, for the query, it, is it raining in Brisbane? So we would be removing our stop words, is it an in? And we, by doing stemming, we can remove the ing. So we would then get the query, rain Brisbane. <laughs> Which, for people who actually do a lot of searching, generally this is actually what we type. It's really funny because if you talk to like, um, either tech savvy young people or computer scientists, they do the same thing where they're like, huh? A sentence, we don't actually need to put this in, we'll just skip steps and just type in some nouns, which is essentially what it's doing for us. Okay, there's a few other things that get done to um, queries to make the search more efficient, um, which you can implement to varying degrees. So one of them is filtering. So filtering the search by a specific field. So if you know that you want to see a horror movie, if you just search horror, you if you just search it by itself, it'd also be looking for everything with horror in the title of the movie, all these other things. But if you knew only genre, you could apply a filter to that to then um, only search within that genre. So I can actually show you that in a second. Um, I'll, I'll explain the other one and then I'll show you it. Um, the other thing is boosting. So that's arbitrarily boosting the weighting of certain fields. So it might be if you are searching Harry Potter, you might want to weigh the name of a movie, Harry Potter, much higher than if there was a director or an actor that happened to be named Harry Potter, even though those would all match exactly the same. So I'm just going to go into Solar now and show you how some of that works here in the beautiful query admin panel. That is not what I wanted this to do. Okay, let me zoom out a bit. Okay, so this is the basic, um, this is the Solar admin panel. This is how you do Solar with the GUI when you want to test things out rather than writing um, HTTP requests to get all your information. Um, so in this, there's a couple of different fields that we have here that are interesting. Let me just turn this on. Uh, I'll leave it on default for now. So Q is where we're trying to do our query. Now, if right now, if I just go execute query, we will get all the documents that exist um, in my collection because what we have up here is we have asterisks, um, colon asterisk. So this is in the syntax for Lucene, which is like um, a language that Solar uses. This, but um, as we commonly know in a lot of like regex and things like that, star is the wild card. It can be anything. So it's saying right here, in any field, return anything. So that is matched all our documents, which is how we have this. Um, but if I did something like, okay, let's search now, will this work? This shouldn't work. 
yeah, it doesn't like it when you do it without a field. But if I do it the other way around and I do this, if I search all the, it's not the title, it's the name, that's the name of the field. If I search name Harry, I will get, you know, what seems to be this uh, Dumb and Dumber movie and then I get all these Harry Potter movies further down because it's only looking in the field title. Um, so that's an example of that. Um, this, what I'm doing right now, is the default parser in Solar is pretty rubbish, um, to be honest, which is why it's the default, no one really uses it because you don't have many settings to fiddle with. Um, what we actually use a lot of the time is either Dismax or Edismax, which are different um, query parsers built into Solar. So if I get rid of this up here, and then I type in, say, actually, let me, I'm just gonna show you how the original one works for a second so I can illustrate how Dismax is better than this one. So I search Harry Potter, it doesn't like me. Of course, um, give me a second. Oh yes, you're right, the field. Yeah, no, I have that, but it's, yeah, you're right, that was me. I really want the data set to be calling it title because it's so much better name, but they keep calling it name. But anyway, so if you search with the field name, um, Harry Potter, weirdly, Harry Potter is not the first result you get. Um, this is probably because the way that it's ranking it, it's not counting this as a phrase and it's looking at it independently and so many other things. But ideally, if you search Harry Potter, you would expect a Harry Potter movie to be at the top. Seems pretty logical. Um, so if we use an actually a better parser like Dismax, and we do Harry Potter, and we apply our uh, query fields would be name, and we do that, we now get it, and the Harry Potter movies are actually at the top. Um, because, uh, mainly because Dismax is a better um, model for it, but there's a whole lot of other things that we consider here. So there's things like we can do um, boosting, um, or we can filter things. So um, quilter, QF is um, filtering the query by an area, so it's saying only look in titles and see if any of them match Harry Potter. Um, we can also do other things like boosting it. Um, so any appearances of those words in other areas would be quite different. So see, I was trying to find an example where we had a, t a character name in a movie that matched a director and I couldn't find any in time. So it's not a great way to illustrate boosting. So um, I will get back to the other part of this. But um, similarly with genre, even though it's a multi-field one, you can do a very similar thing. So if we had, say, genre, and we had thriller. Yeah, so we'd also be searching it by whatever the tags are for that. Um, but interestingly enough, yeah, I wonder how much the weighting would differ based on how many times this hits. That, because um, some of this has psychological thriller and thriller. So I wonder how much of an impact that would have. I'd have to look into the configs more for that and fiddle with that because ideally I'd want it to hit more of those. But um, yeah, so you can write in fields here and then weight it by different amounts. Let me go back to converting. Do, do, do. Okay, cool. Um, so yes, now does anyone have any questions so far or should I just keep going to the end and wait for questions? Okay, cool. So you were selecting between different, are those different querying models? Like so what I had before with the it, Dismax and Edismax and all of that, all these fields. Yeah. So the yeah, they're different like algorithms, but so, so it's different. kind of these are kind of different parameters which you can handle. So if we go solar Yeah, like Dismax versus Edismax. Yeah, Edismax is the extended Dismax parser, so it's kind of like has a bunch of extra features that Dismax doesn't have that builds on it. But in terms of all those different fields, you have a lot of things to do with different parameters that you can tinker with. So we have, you know, the, the raw parameter, um, things like query fields, so um, the fields to perform it on, so if we want to filter things down, uh, minimum number of clauses that should match. So you can do all these things like saying, okay, if we're searching Harry Potter, we need a minimum of two things to match for Harry and the Potter. We don't want anything with just Harry in it, and things like that. Um, and there's similar things with phrasing that you can specify, um, and also with boosting queries. Um, but yeah, and then Edismax has some other fancier stuff. Um, 
which is the one I have more experience with because that was the baseline I was comparing to when I did stuff at Canva. But yeah, a lot of a lot of people use Solar or Elasticsearch. Um, I, was trying to think of, I was trying to think of common things that are also built off it. I know, I think Shopify, I think is built off Elasticsearch. The course I did here at UQ is built off Elasticsearch, but the documentation for that is very similar. It's just implemented quite differently. Um, but yeah, it's mainly things like more parameters and aliasing that you can do in here, which is quite exciting. Um, so yeah, do you have any more questions about that before I continue? Cool, cool, cool. Okay, cool. Yeah, so now I'm gonna talk a bit about ranking. And um, I wasn't gonna go too deep into this because it gets very massy. And to be honest, when I started writing this slide, my computer started lagging, so I couldn't copy over equations. But I also thought, like most software engineer people, I like applying the maths, but I don't particularly like learning about it, which sounds a bit... <laughs> I see some people, I know there's a lot of math students in the room, but no, it's really interesting stuff. But um, yeah, so essentially, um, when we get our documents, say it matches these things, to determine the order in which they show up, we we do have to apply some sort of ranking algorithm. So the two main properties that we consider is the term frequency in a document and the term frequency in a corpus. So in terms of a document, if you're searching, if the search is fish and you find a document with a bunch of the word fish in it, you're like, okay, cool, this is probably relevant. Um, for example, but another thing to consider is the term frequency in the corpus. So if you have very specific terms, that can help you with that. So for example, if you Google your own name, most of the documents that Google sees will not have your own name in it. So then it will then rank higher all the things that do have your name in it because it realizes that your specific name as a phrase is quite rare. So some functions that are like the basic ones that people start with to do these are things like term frequency which directly looks at how often the term appears in the document um, inverse document frequency which yeah it's kind of looking at how much it appears in the corpus and some other things like that but i can't remember the formula for that off the top of my head so please don't um, at me if i stuff that up right now and tfidf combines both of those and then one of the most common is bm25 so it's essentially looking at how much we're waiting how much the term appears in a document versus the overall frequency of it to try and get a sense of how relevant this document is in terms of its text. So a really good example of this was when I was googling the UQCS. Um, so here I have the search results for UQCS in both DuckDuckGo and Google. And as you can see, it doesn't, it's not exactly the same. Um, this is a really good indicator of how the different um, ranking algorithms work for these different search engines. So how they've decided to incorporate weighing different fields um, in terms of document frequency, but also they might have artificial boosts. Like, as we can see here, um, on the one on the left of DuckDuckGo, we have two different pages at the top that are both directly from the UQCS website, while Google has Twitter in the top four. So potentially on Google's end, they might be prioritizing um, social media platforms and realizing that that's something that people want to see a lot of the time. It's perhaps because they have tiles like that, which provides this information, but all sorts of things like that. Another thing is, if you have a look at the um, Facebook pages that are linked, it's two slightly different titles that appear, because this one that's ranked higher is matching it as UQ Computing Society, but DuckDuckGo it's, has it indexed as the University of Queensland Computing Society, which doesn't match as well. So these are sort of things that you can think about, is there are all these factors that, not just in terms of algorithms, but other things. Yeah? Is the one on the left the page and the one on the right the group? Ah, okay, yeah, I was trying to tell the difference, but um, yeah, you're right, actually. Yeah, so then that's also, what does that say about Facebook in and of it, like, the algorithm in and of itself, is that, is that go, is it weighing pages more highly? Is it things like that? Yeah, no, that makes sense. I was trying to, I was trying to work out the difference with it, and I hadn't stared at it too hard. But no, that makes sense. Um, so yes, yeah, so that's just something to think about. Um, yeah, and how those sorts of things line up because um, the way that these things are ranked varies a lot. Another big example would be if you think of if you've ever done shopping online. Um, 
we have our ranking based on you know whatever it thinks is relevant and you can filter by all sorts of things like ordering by price but oftentimes if you do shopping um, the search engine uh, might arbitrarily introduce ads to the top because it's decided okay this might not be as relevant but we'll artificially boost it because someone's paid to have this shown as an ad so that's an example of how that works okay so one of the last things is this is kind of the big questions with relevance that's kind of hard is how to evaluate your search and is it any good because the short answer is it's actually hard to tell um so there's two main things that people do to evaluate how well their search is performing um the most kind of pure mathsy one um pure and mathsy separate words not pure maths um, is offline evaluation so this is when documents have relevance data so we have a test data set with, that has marked relevance to test our algorithm on. So sometimes you can just hijack machine learning data sets because there's plenty of those out there and it has the same information. But it's this whole idea that we can set this up with our test data, run a bunch of test queries and check to see whether or not these, um, what we got returned matches what we expected to return. So we use formulas like precision and recall to look at portion of relevant documents retrieved. Um, so they look at um, if we know we have 100 relevant documents and your search only returned 80, it's like, well, you're missing 20 relevant documents. Um, so it's looking at, that could be one way of looking at, um, did it retrieve all the relevant ones? And another thing is um, with those measures is looking at, did it over return things? Like if there was only 50 relevant documents, did it return 200 results knowing a bunch of them were garbage? So that's what those sort of measures look like, which is great when you have good data sets, um, but most of the time you don't in real life, which is what online evaluation comes to. So when you have no relevance data, the closest that you can use is implicit feedback. Um, so that's by measuring clicks and other page interactions as indications of relevance. This is a very, I would say, it's an approximate method. It depends on what you're using it for. Um, it can be quite tricky because sometimes, for context, um, you might be searching, if you're searching for something really general, like say, uh, templates for a presentation that you want to do, you might search blue, because I like templates with blue backgrounds, but you might actually see some other results in there that don't actually match your initial query very well, but still suit you. Another example might be if you like search smartphone on an e-commerce website and a tablet appeared, but you clicked on the tablet because you found that cool anyway, it would be artificially telling the search that, oh, that's actually relevant, when it might not be, it might just be in that specific situation. So it, um, it varies depending on the context quite a bit, but often it's the best that we have in these sorts of situations. Um, search engines like Google famously use this to a really big degree. They have a page rank algorithm and a lot of what people are clicking on and things like that, they do play a role. Um, but yeah, so that is one way that that's handled. Um, that is the end of the stuff I have done at the moment because I didn't want to go too deep. But um, this is the further reading of things that I like to read about this sort of thing, which is the big one is the textbook uh, Relevant Search, which my supervisor at Canva made me read. And it was actually really, really interesting. Um, and other things is if you are able to at this uni, there is the course IMPS 7410, um, which is the information retrieval and web, oh, web search engines. Yeah, I wasn't sure what the rest of it was. Yeah. Otherwise, the documentation for it. There's a lot of really cool um, tutorials online on how to set up these things. Um, particularly, um, you yeah, know, I've mainly done the solar ones because that's what I find interesting. But there's also a lot of things, um, other things you can add into it, like plugins and things like that. Um, so yes, any questions? Okay, cool, 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 Sunny. Yeah. Um, when you set up, when you set up your solar yeah. Do you have to do that like manually for each field, um, or are there like things where you can, it can generate the So generally you have to set it up manually, but once you have it set up, um, it, you never have to change it. Um, in I th some schema properties you can change through a GUI. So I've um, 
for solar, for example, has a managed schema option where you can just use a GUI to add fields. Um, but sometimes it doesn't um, it doesn't behave you want it the way that you want it to. So I usually just write it out in the XML because sometimes it there is conflicting updates between that and the GUI one, but there are GUIs where I can actually show you one here. Da, da, da. If you go to schema, schema, so you can actually just add a field to be like, tell me what type of field it is based on the existing stuff. But, um, but things like the field types, they would already have to be defined. So I can't add, for example, the type string here that was already defined in the schema. Um, but I could add in new fields through this. There's other things like copy fields, which uh, essentially combines multiple fields to act as like an arbitrary additional field. So say if you had like a field for director and producer, and you wanted to make a field that was just all the people who worked in this film in an executive capacity, you could make a copy field of like executive people and have it copy in the values producer and director without having to duplicate the data. It would just kind of link it together. Um, oh, I forget what that one is off the top of my head because I didn't use it very much. Um, I mainly used the other two. So, yeah. So does that mean if you have a really large they have a lot of fields that you have to Yeah, so the big thing is the setup can take a while for your schema. Um, it's also important to try and um, make sure your schema is right the first time because um, if you have a million documents and it takes an hour to index everything, every time you change your schema you have to re-index it. So you want to make sure you have it right. <laughs> um, but also a lot of times for people who do really large scale search with these sorts of tools, it's you don't really need to find it the first time or make small changes as your data changes. Um, yeah, because there's a lot of overhead to that. But um, you can, yeah. So sort of on that, the like big brother search engines, surely they're not like, there's not a monkey somewhere sitting away putting, adding my website to okay. like putting all the fields and stuff. In. So are you talking big brother search engine like Google and Bing and yeah. so on and so forth? Are so, they using Elasticsearch? No. Like, okay. <laughs> they, they keep how their search works. It's a very closely guarded secret. Um, how search works at Google, for example, is they keep that on the down low. Tools like Solar and um, Elasticsearch are a lot of enterprise and just people in general use it because it's like, hey, I need search, but search isn't my product in and of itself. So for the case of Google and Bing, search is the product. Having search work well is what they are trying to do. But for people who they need search to work and they, need, they want to have frameworks to adjust all of these things to make it work, um, tools like this often it makes a lot more sense you know just like how everything there's always you could do something from scratch or you could use an existing framework so yeah that's kind of where solar and elastic search come in any other question yeah kenton um can you talk a little bit about how it works behind the scenes like what kind of data structure the index uses or what kind of algorithm it uses to um, look up things within the Okay, so the index itself, it's an inverted index. Um, so kind of how that works is, I'm trying to remember the best way to explain this because I'm a little bit rusty. Um, but essentially it's a really good way to look at it. It's actually Google inverted index and the diagrams that you get. I don't know, what am I doing? Googling in my own presentation. But um, essentially it's, um, it's looking at the ways that you map words to itself. So, um, if you have um, different terms at different positions, essentially you can map what terms that you have. Um, if you store this information in an index, rather than having an entire document to pass, you could store, okay, these are the terms we have. Say you have the word fished and it appears you know, in our document at position 4, 100, and 200. You would just store those document positions. So you can just check if that term exists and then how often it appears in the document rather than having to say pass the entire document each time. So it's essentially storing the critical information, which in our case is the existence of these terms and um, the document, the position within the document in an index like that. Now, 
a lot of people who do research in information retrieval, um, they know a lot more about these sorts of things uh, because that's what they like going into and improving the efficiency of that. Um, my experience is more on the uh, getting it to work side of things, so there's a limited amount of answer I can give you, I'm afraid, but um, if you look into the docs of um, like Solar or Elasticsearch, it should tell you more detail about the specific parts of that. Yeah. I had another question about, because we were talking earlier about like doing natural language processing or yeah. like searches, right? Um, sort of like, I guess, um, I was going to ask um, kind of like, uh, how do they kind of like, you, you mentioned like duck and ducking, those are two very different yeah. things. Like duckling and duck fall into the same category. Like, like how do search engines kind of work around? Do they, like how do they figure out? Because obviously like if they can't make yeah, I mean, a lot of, there's a bunch of different strategies. Um, there's a lot of machine learning going into that sort of thing right now. Where if you look at, well, there's n-grams, which is a more traditional method, but also you can use that with machine learning. Um, is if um, if you have, for example, a model and you see all the ducks that appear in this context of like birds and ponds is very different to um, that. You you can um, different methods that you can use to see the different. Um, closeness to those different concepts but another one that gets used a lot is this idea of n-grams which is in natural language processing it's essentially splitting things up into chunks of n number of words so um, if you have the phrase you know today it is raining you could look at today is and then is raining is two separate chunks so you can also split things up into phrases that way and try and see if that gives you any clues to how that works um, but yeah um, a lot of times it's the other words in that context which will kind of tell you the difference because if you search like rubber duck you the most common things that would appear most often is if you're talking about you know a plastic duck which programmers talk to sometimes rather than um, rubber and the concept of ducking which doesn't really work together yeah um, if I want to have, if I want to have search Um, the production reasons you can run solar, or you, you can run elastic search as well. Like um, when I was at Canberra, I was working on solar because they have a, the search that they use within that is a based off solar. So they have a bunch of custom stuff that they do on top of that. Um, but a lot of it um, is based on solar. So that's kind of how I learned a lot of this. Um, the course I did here at UQ did a bit on elastic search, but that was abstracted away quite a bit. Um, but yeah, so if you are putting stuff into production, you can use these tools. It's not just for a like research point of view or things like that. Um, like because you can, there's APIs you can have to HTTP requests and get this data back. I'm just using this the dashboard because it's easier to show you all rather than just running a script. But yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, cool. We good. No more questions. Cool, thank you. So they will they are sending some people from there as well. So if you want to network with some um, IMC grads um, and engineers, uh, that would be a great time to do that as well. Um, yeah. And there will be food as well, yes. Um, so we will be catering lunch. So it'll be a good time. Um, and even if you don't think you're good enough, um, just come. It's, it's a great place to learn. People are happy to help you solve your problems and you can, you know, get some hacker rank practice for your interviews as well. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, thank you again, Annabelle, for coming. I think, I think I, I think I get Google now. I'm gonna build my own Google now. I'll be Google. Oh, you want to Google? I am Google. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you.